everyone. Welcome to another episode of Security Confidential. Uh, this is your host, Manoj Tandon, and today we are joined by our very own Matt Castengay. And uh, Matt joins us from the wonderful city of Montreal. Uh, you know, Matt's been a developer, he's a computer scientist, entrepreneur, and now a partner at Dark Rhino Security, who is responsible for business development. So welcome to the show, Matt. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Hey, Matt, so that's, I mean, you've done a little bit of everything. So are, I got to ask you to start off with, are you a sales guy masquerading as a developer or are you a developer masquerading as a sales guy? Which way? <laughs> I, I, I think it's a bit of both. I think uh, I, I'm always going to enjoy the development background. That's why I came through. That's what I did in school. That's what I did when I was a kid. Um, so this is like definitely a lot of fun for me in understanding how things work. I can't just accept that they work. I have to understand how they work. Uh, so the programming, the development's always been really fun, but I'm also a people person. I enjoy doing the networking, I enjoy doing the conferences, the trade shows, the, uh, presentations. So it, it, I was able to merge sort of both, uh, as I gained more experience as a developer to gain that confidence to go in and do presentations and explain that to people. Uh, so I would say at the core, I am a developer, but uh, I really enjoy sales and I really enjoy, you know, presenting and understanding uh, what goes on behind the scenes. And, and I'll tell you, I, I'm impressed with your communication skills. You know, I have to believe that English is not your first language, right? That's uh, right. So is that a skill that every person growing up in Quebec is learning English? Well, uh, you know, when I was a kid, the thing is like, I played a lot of video games and spent a lot of time on the computer. And nowadays you just have a language option. You can like switch anything into any language. But back then it was, everything was in English. So you had no choice, but to learn to, to read some of the, of the words in English to understand it so that you could interact with these software or play these video games. Uh, also when I was a kid, uh, my dad got a job transfer and we moved to Toronto. So I ended up growing wow. up in the Toronto area which is a very predominantly English speaking area. So for me, I, when I was a kid, I started always having to speak English. I was playing hockey, everybody on my team spoke English, you know, going to school, uh, making friends. And then just everything was done in English. So I'd speak French at home and I'd speak French uh, English outside of home. So for me, switching back and forth between the two is, is very, very natural. I have to say, yeah, we can't, uh, tell it's, uh, I'm glad so, to hear that. <laughs> none, of, none of us could tell. <laughs> so, it's, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, as you say, it's 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 usually until people see my name that they they're like, oh, you know, what's what's your background? So uh, but usually in conversations and something like that, it doesn't usually come up. Your journey from developer to entrepreneur, how the heck did that take place? Okay, so I used to write uh these programs as a teenager in the visual basic and, and just published them online. Um, back then there was really no search engines like you have today. There was no peer to peer sharing program. So essentially um, it was basically along the lines of uh, forums and things like that, where you would just share the stuff that you've done. Um, I, I learned I self, I taught myself, you know, HTML, CSS, there wasn't really much JavaScript back then. So, uh, I taught myself how to make basic websites, things like that. And and the thing is, you, you start by doing a website, like an amateur website for a video game, for example. But then, you know, you hear of someone that needs a website, and then that's how the uh, the business side started. So I would make uh, programs or websites for people that needed them. Um, when I went to uh, university, I did my degree in uh, computer science at the University of Ottawa. And I met a couple of people who were also, like, you know, interested in starting a business and things like that. So we discussed a lot and I didn't start anything with them, but it just gave me that uh, boost of confidence saying, hey, we this is doable. Uh, and then eventually after working a couple of years in Montreal, uh, met a business partner that I was working with who uh, we ended up, you know, starting a business on the side and then grew into a full scale company that uh, was later acquired by Dark Rhino. So. Um, you know, the journey was there, but from the beginning, I always enjoyed building things for others and saw that there's an opportunity to make money there as well. You know, uh, 
it's very rare to have uh, people who have the technical skill set and the business savvy. Yeah, I started on the side while I was working other jobs. So I was working for a large telecommunications company and I was working there as a software engineer and it was, you know, it was paying the bills, but it was basically an ends to a mean, uh, sorry, Got means it. to an end. So <laughs> to, uh, to get to that, um, uh, you know, being able to self-sustain the business and to live off of the business. So uh, building, we, we built a, a content management platform, which I started from scratch based on uh, what was on the market at the time was, you know, the WordPress wasn't there yet and all the other stuff, Shopify wasn't there. So we, we sort of built this intuitive uh, tool that clients could use to, to make their own website. So that was kind of, again, bridging both the, the technology, building something new and having fun doing it and then having it be a viable commercial product that we could end up selling. And, you know, for our listeners, I'd like to point out, you know, Dark Rhino uh, Security, we originally were not in the uh, web hosting business. Uh, we acquired a company called Proteon Software, which was actually a competitor to you, Matt, right? That's right. Right. Yeah. And then uh, subsequently, um, we acquired MG2 Media, which is, you were the M in the MG2 Media, correct? Uh, That's right. Yeah, exactly. One of the co-founders. So, exactly. So we um, we started. Um, you know, the, we built the CMS, the content management system. Uh, we dabbled in a lot of different businesses, e-commerce websites, uh, standard, you know, content websites, and then we ended up in the associations business. So managing uh, members, um, access, event registrations, online payments, recurring membership fees. Uh, and creating a, a sort of a dashboard for the administrators to be able to delegate certain access rights, to different uh, volunteers or people who work within the organization uh, for them to manage their invoicing, their billing, everything all in one, under one roof. So uh, that turned out to be a pretty big success. And we ended up with, you know, clients in multiple countries, uh, all on a, on a, you know, recurring revenue basis, which was a very interesting model for us rather than just having one big project. Uh, you have a smaller uh, introduction fee, but then you have a recurring fee over the years that the client uses the platform. Um, so that's a model that we shifted and we, we shifted with the market. Um, there's nowadays there are tons of CMSs on the market, you know, with WordPress being one of the biggest ones and Shopify right. Magento in the e-commerce space. So it, it wasn't worth it to compete in that space anymore and i wouldn't want to go back and compete in that space um the, the web development and programming as a whole has changed so much from what it was you know a decade ago that now it's all about uh, having a product it's all about having something that's easily instantaneously accessible and, and based more on a recurring monthly uh, model which is exactly what shopify does rather than like a one lump sum and then some maintenance fees afterwards right i mean the whole world is gone is going and trending towards a much more subscription-based model rather than a perpetual licensing yeah. model. But when you look at uh, like what one of our prior app, uh, acquisitions, Proteon, which I briefly mentioned, uh, they were built off an open source platform called Joomla. That's right. right? And, and then you went off and you built a competing application on your own platform. You you actually built the platform. You didn't uh, utilize Joomla or WordPress or any of those uh, off the shelf, Ruby on Rails or any of these technologies that were there. Was there, what was the decision point for that? Why not use an open source uh, off the shelf technology? When we um, started building the platform, the uh, biggest CMS on the market at the time was called PHP Nuke or .NET Nuke, which was the, the Microsoft version of it. Um, it was, a CMS that was for its time was very good, but very limited in the ways that you could modify the page. You were stuck. Every site had the same three column template. Every site, you know, looked the same. You, your customization was basically the color palette. It wasn't uh, much more than that. You couldn't drag and drop things around. You couldn't live edit any of the pages. So we built it based on what was on the market at the time. I'm talking around, you know, 2006, 2007. Um, then other CMSs came along, and nowadays they've they've really like I mean there's libraries, endless libraries of plugins for them. But at the time, it just that was what the solution that made sense. 
And if you look at today, if you look at a lot of the commercially viable uh, cloud-based applications, they're all, uh, you know, closed source programs, but a lot of times they're based on open source technologies. A lot of them are right. running on uh, Linux servers, which are entirely free in terms of the, the software approach. Uh, a lot of the modern technology is running on Node.js. It's built in JavaScript. It's built on free technologies, but uh, then these companies build their own proprietary platform based on that. So the model has kind of gone full circle where everything was open source or everything was closed source, then it went to open source, and now it's a mixed, like sort of hybrid of both. Yeah, and you know what we found, um, like we're we acquired uh, the company that had built the CMS on the Joomla platform, and it works, and it, and it worked, yeah. and it works well even today. But you are, if you stick purely to open source without putting your own detailed customizations into it, you really never end up optimizing for your specific business use cases. That's right. I mean, and if you take the associations model, which is what we were using it here in this uh, example, is if you have a couple hundred websites running on Joomla, they might not all be on the same versions. They're all kind of like these uh, independent silos with their own SQL database, their own uh, directory of files. And that, and that gets messy uh, it, from a management point of view. If you want to update things, uh, there are tools that allow you to update multiple sites at once. But then again, there's always risks associated to that. Uh, it, it becomes difficult when you want to move things around um or when you want to manage you know load balancing things like that the platform that we had built was was uh SaaS, so it's a software as a service so essentially there's only one instance of the cms running on the server regardless of there being 20 100 or 500 websites running on the server now what that means is that you don't have a duplicate of 500 copies of the platform uh maintenance and updates are done almost in instantaneously without any downtime um so there's a lot of different aspects to it that are oh, and the security yeah. aspects are tremendous right and, exactly. and we look at it i mean i'm a little biased there because i you know know a lot about security and uh, yeah. that that's been our heritage having a single instance being able to patch it maintain it monitor it uh for any potential malicious threats is much easier than looking across 200 different instances of something and I guess, you know, for our listeners, that's what we mean by that, or that's what I mean by not being able to optimize for a particular use case. If you go completely open source without adding your own special sauces to it, you know, it'll, okay. you know, uh, open source will get you 80% of the there, uh, of the way they're out of the box. But what makes you special is that last 20%. You're going to have to add those components in to truly have something like we've done in the associations market, where it's a very uh, focused application that is really well geared for what those folks are doing in terms of managing their events and managing their memberships and uh, informing and communicating their their uh, subscribers. Right. Right. So, and, and that's kind of hard to do um, with other equation. Uh, model, which is why we're migrating everybody off of uh, the Joomla technology into what you have built, Matt, what what you and Jeff actually ended up building and, and uh, putting out there. So, yeah. Now, when you are looking at, you, you've seen a plethora of technologies come to market, and I'm just not talking CMS, but in general, when you look at the technology market place if you are a software developer contemplating commercializing an application like you did what do you think a couple things are that you should really kind of uh test the the weather with before you go in and say okay we're going to jump in all in and we're going to go ahead and commercialize something Right. Yeah, so it used to be that you would, you know, draw up specs and then you would create mockups and you sort of do the whole layout of the application. You can still do that once you know where you're going with your product, but technology these days have made it so much easier to just boot something up and, and get a program up and running, whether it's a mobile app, whether it's a, uh, you know, everything's going web-based. There's not that many desktop-based applications anymore outside of the gaming industry, of course. 
so it really depends what field you're in. And I, I don't have personally have much experience with uh, game development, and I, that, I feel that's a whole other branch on its own. Uh, but there are platforms like Unity now that have made also game development much uh, simpler. But essentially, when you're looking at development these days, your software is most likely going to be web-based uh, so that it's easily accessible from any device. Uh, and if you have a mobile app, you're probably communicating with the same backend system through REST API or, um, or something along those lines. So essentially what you want to look at is what are the best choices of technology I can make to develop that platform? And that usually implies, is it something that's just brand new on the market? Is it something that's been battle tested? Um, so there's and there's so many platforms out there it's difficult to choose but a lot of them are based on javascript nowadays so essentially that's that's something to look at um, look at what back-end infrastructure you want to be using uh, try to get something that's easy to have uh, what we call uh, an mvp uh, which is your, your your minimal viable product which okay. is essentially uh, what can i build that has the basic features of of my application and without having to go too far into details and test that out and see if there's a, a need for it, see how well it, it reacts with people. And then if, it, if that's successful, then, then you can build on your MVP and, and either go again from scratch or uh, you know add upon it, but don't try to get this perfect product out the door. And I've seen too many uh, startups or companies fail with that, trying to get the perfect product, having everything flawless, um, it's not how things are done anymore because then you, you put that out there and your customer base says, oh, I don't like this feature, I don't like that. And then you just, you know, lost so much money and time on something that wasn't necessary. You know what, the, my, my uh, advice on that would be, as you termed it very appropriately, the MVP. Yeah. I think your MVP should be at least 3X better than whatever the heck is already on the market. Right. If you're going to make a run at commercializing and being very successful with the technology that you're developing, if if you're equal to, I don't know that you're going to have a lot of success, right? Unless your uh, strategy is to be a a follower, a, a low cost follower, which is maybe a perfectly in a matured market that may be the the thing. But uh, where you've been playing, it's been uh, on the bleeding edge. And uh, if you're on the bleeding edge, you want to make sure that you maintain that distance from your competition uh, Absolutely. When, you're, yeah. when you're putting your, and so that MVP really better be pretty, pretty solid in its core, what it does relative right. to what the competition has to offer. Exactly. I see a lot of companies, uh, I, I've known a lot of VC backed companies that have failed with that, you know, where mm -hmm. they didn't, um, do that self-evaluation of their own product and say, are we really that much better than what is out there? Right. And, and you know, be, be wary of people who are not too critical because if you go to your immediate surroundings, they'll support you and they might say, oh, that's a good idea, it's smart. And then you're not getting the exact feedback that you should be getting. Um, and then what I've seen a lot of happen is people come out and they say, well, everybody likes my product or everybody likes my website. It's like, no, the people who are around you don't tell you the truth. And, and then and then you hit that roadblock of criti criticism and then some people just can't take that and they, they'll they keep pushing, you know, they'll keep beating that dead horse rather than, than uh, either stopping what they're doing and trying something new or cha go, changing things and going a different direction. You know, uh, that is a very astute observation, Matt. I the number of entrepreneurs that can dissociate emotionally from their creation yeah. is minimal. And that means, I think that might be a huge contribution to failure because you really have to emotionally dissociate from what you've built and be willing to look at it is that it is just an object. And if the market says that object is good, great. If the market mm -hmm. is saying that object is crap, well, don't try and keep telling the market it's good because the market right. doesn't really care about your opinion. Right. Exactly. Exactly. That's, uh, that's, that's well put. Right. Uh, and we've 
I have personally in my own experience with startups seen that come over and over again is that uh, typically entrepreneurs don't want to get that kind of feedback and they get uh, very, very emotional and guarded about it if you bring it up, which is maybe why people around you won't tell you the truth, Matt. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> but no, you know, it, it, there's, there's, um, I love the startup world I, I think it's great i think it's good for for people to just try stuff out obviously try to do it at a, at a minimal financial risk um you know don't mortgage your house trying to start something uh but at the same time don't don't expect to be you know the next mark zuckerberg and all of a sudden become a billionaire like there, there's people that jump through you know tons of steps and, and hit the top right away but for the majority of business owners it's a grind and it's a never-ending grind and uh, if you if you stay true to that, and if you're understanding that, and you follow the path, and you work hard at it, there's a possibility that it'll work, but there's also a possibility that it won't. Uh, you can do everything right and still fail. But, Absolutely. Yeah. Lady Luck has to play her hand. Absolutely. I, I know people. Yeah. I, I and you get all the uh, you know the cliched sayings with that that you create your own luck. You know, mm -hmm. entrepreneurs are people who overcome bad luck or. I, but at some point, uh, you know, your 99.9% .9 perspiration, 0.1%, you know, you're you're ultimately playing on the roulette table. I mean, Absolutely. It, 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 business is a risk, and anyone that thinks that it's not a risk should not be in business. Yeah, and, and there's, there's a question of timing as well, right? Like, if you, there's always the example of, uh, was it the Microsoft Zoom and, and, and the, Palm Pilot, like there's technologies that predated all the stuff that Apple did, but they, they were too ahead of their time. It wasn't as user friendly as the Apple products were. And then Steve Jobs came along and, and repackaged everything and, and it was a massive hit. So the iPod wasn't anything innovative technologically wise, technological wise, but uh, you know, they marketed in a way that, that it worked and it was a timing in the industry that, that worked. Um, you know, you know, in fact, you bring up one of my favorite examples with that, yeah. uh, you know, one of the, you know, Palm Pilot. So if you look at, yeah. if you look at the history of those technology, Apple was the first company to bring a PDA, one of the first companies to bring a PDA to market with their Apple Newton. I don't know how many people listening to this podcast even remember that, but it was a, it was a PDA and it had handwriting recognition. It was big, it was clunky, mm -hmm. um, but when it was introduced, it was way ahead of its time, yeah. right? And it was a colossal failure. And this is from a company like Apple. Right. And then you, but what it did do was it educated the market enough that such a possibility exists. And it along came Palm and it opened the door for Palm to improve upon the deficiencies that were there and really take care of a late, uh, a latent demand that was, that was available, but mm -hmm. had the Newton not come along, I don't know that that latent demand would have ever been created. Mm -hmm. Timing, so you could have the better technology, uh, you could have the better product, and you could certainly be avant-garde, but those are not necessarily recipes for success always. No, of course not. And, and you know, the, there's, um, the, I think either the week or within a certain amount of days that of Steve Jobs' passing, another man passed away, Dennis Ritchie. And, and you know, he's a guy who invented the C programming language. He's a guy who, in part, invented Unix. And you have all the technologies that Apple made billions of dollars off of and the same guy who built them. And, you know, who obviously has a book and, and, and you know, movies made after him and everything else. So it's really interesting how the perception and everything else goes along. And sometimes we don't ever really know about those people behind the scenes that have made such amazing progress on the technology because we look at the more glamorous, the more marketing approach. Uh, you know, one of my, you know, idols is, is John Carmack and John Carmack's a brilliant hey. game developer, also brilliant programmer, mathematician, and everything else. And, you know, I, I've watched every podcast he's been on. I've read his book. I, I, I follow him. And it's just amazing the, the, you know, the progress he's done and the path he's taken in his life. But he's not usually as well known as, as many of the others who uh, either were CEOs or marketed things, everything else. But he was the brains behind, you know, everything that we have today in 3D technology is, is partially thanks to him. 
so it, it's interesting to see how some of these uh, behind the scenes players and John Carmack is still someone that's somewhat famous, but I mean, like not on the level that, uh, you know, a Steve Jobs or Zuckerberg is, but in, in terms of brilliance, I mean, he's way up there. Well, yeah, I, I wonder if you took a poll, how many people would know who Dennis Ritchie is, right? Yeah, exactly. I, I, right. I, and if you look at the C language, even today, uh, what does JavaScript at runtime translation? It's still turning into C, right? It's exactly. it's a core, you're right? It's a core, uh, it's a core foundational item. But the people who get the glory, you know, you look at Steve Jobs, he had an immense ability to understand what consumer markets wanted, right? Yeah. So it's one thing to have, how do you make the hammer? It's a whole nother thing to use that hammer and turn it into a house that's going to sell, right? Right. Different visions, exactly. and and unfortunately, who should get more glory? The ha the guy who created the hammer or the architect of the house? I, it's probably going to end up being the architect of the house because that's what people will see at the end of the day, right? That's right. More people will see it and they're like, "Man, that's really yeah. cool. What 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 is that thing?" You know. So yeah. talk to me a little bit about selling. Um, when when you created a new platform and then going into selling it do you have any suggestions or tips for other folks that might be contemplating the same thing things to consider in a new startup company on the sales side uh that that might provide some guidance on achieving some success because um, you guys were successful i'll give you that that's why we bought you guys <laughs> yeah <laughs> it, it, it's you know sales is relentlessness it's uh uh you know it, it's interesting it's uh the the approach that it requires is very strong mix of a human approach and and also knowledge of, of the product or the situation approach so uh, a lot of times when you're selling, you have to try to find a connection with the person that you're selling to, especially here we're talking like B2B sales of, you know, software contracts and things like that. So we're not talking about uh, a selling a product to consumer. It's a much different approach, right? So when you're selling a, a contract in, you know, the five, six uh, figure range or even more, um, it, it's you have to build a sort of connection with the person. You have to see anticipate what they're looking for, try to understand what their business model is, do some research, don't just show up unprepared, like read up, you know, these days you have the person's LinkedIn profile, you have their company about page, you know, try to know as much as you can before going in. Um, so that will really help. Uh, don't uh, sell yourself short. Don't, if you, if you feel like the, the sale is slipping, don't just say, oh, you know what, I'll give you a discount, I'll give you this for free. Just just try, try to, to see uh, you know, why is it slipping away? Are you not meeting their demand? Is this a product that will work for them? And also be um, wary of your own time as well. There are sales calls or presentations where within five minutes, you know, this is not the right fit. You know, you're not going to sell. You know, the, your product is not what they're looking for. It's okay to just say, you know what? I don't think this is the right fit and, and, and move on. Um, don't try to just push on that either. Lose fast. That's yeah. a... That's another thing. I, I think a lot of salespeople, a lot of very experienced salespeople I know, even today, have a little bit of a difficult time with hearing no, right? Exactly. Or, or, or buying into it, the, uh, or having the self-realization that this is probably just a bad idea. Let's get out of it. You don't want to waste endless time because that's so limited on the sales cycle. Plus, you don't exactly. want your client gets irritated too, right? I mean, if you keep trying to yeah. sell me that I don't want, I'm gonna be like, come yeah. on. Yeah. How many people ignore calls or don't follow up because you know it's it's not for them. And uh, what I find is a little difficult too, especially I've seen this at trade shows. Is you'll meet people at trade shows and they'll come and talk to you, and they'll uh, you know they'll talk about your product or your service as if it's something um, that they're interested in. And you're like, okay, you, you know, you put them in your CRM and you put them as a, you know, 50, 60% chance prospect. And then you never hear back from them when you try to reach out to them. So, so these days, there's a lot of people that, that want, they're too polite. They don't want to say no. Uh, so again, if you don't feel like it's going to happen, um, try, try to give them one last chance. Be like, listen, are you, were you seriously interested or not? And if they don't answer, just move on. Don't take it personally. Um, even the best salespeople don't have a hundred percent closing rate. No one has a hundred percent closing rate. So That's right. 
you you have to try to learn from the ones that uh, don't work out, and uh, you learn learn you learn as much from a sale as you do from from a, from a no, and and from that no, try to see was it was it your presentation was it something you did wrong or was it not the right fit and all that. So, and, and try to continuously improve your your presentation. You know, uh, a lot of what you've talked about uh, mm -hmm. thus far comes down to having a self-evaluative nature to be successful, right? Not yeah. just as a salesperson, but as an entrepreneur and achieving commercial success. If I guess you, you need to have some ability to objectively look in the mirror and self-evaluate to have those yeah. kinds of improvement opportunities work out for you. Absolutely. Um... Another thing too is is the the cultural background and and you know I, I've done sales in different languages and it's a different approach and and when you deal with different cultures as well, uh, you know I, I I've sold a lot of uh, products and services uh, in the Asian market and the Middle Eastern market and the European market and they're and and of course you know Canada and the U S and it's it's very different. Um, so try try to know who you're selling to. Try to understand. The culture, try to understand what's appropriate, what's acceptable, and all that. Um, that can definitely help uh, give you an edge uh, when you're doing that pitch. So, g give an example. Like, what do you find? Like, e I'm curious. What's the difference between like selling to somebody in uh, Quebec and selling to maybe somebody stateside? So, um, the, the the Latin blood is very different than the, the American blood, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> In the U.S., it's not so much about the price or you know the 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 cost and the things like that. It, it's more about the customer service. Am I going to get you know effed over on this, or is this going to be good service? Are these people going to really deliver what they ask? And if that's the case, I don't mind paying for quality. I don't mind paying the price. Uh, when you're when you're selling in Quebec, it, it's different. People bargain a lot negotiate a lot it's it they, they'll try to nickel and dime you it's a very different approach uh there, there's definitely more money in the u.s than there is uh, in quebec so it's it's a very different approach in quebec people will look at the price tag sometimes before they look at the quality of the service and that will result in a, in a lot of bad decisions being made down the road and and uh but ultimately that's one of the big differences uh yeah that, but that's cultural right as opposed right. to have you found that true in the Middle East as well, where there's a lot more negotiating that takes place? De definitely. Uh, in the middle, and what's interesting too is, uh, you know, when I was dealing with clients in Dubai, is that, you know, everybody speaks Arabic with each other, but all their business, all their contracts are done in English. For them, English is like the language of business, and uh, they enjoy doing business overseas. They enjoy, uh, you know, get, getting that quality of service, but don't negotiate you every aspect of everything on the contract and and it's part of the culture so you can't take it personally you can't you know they're just trying to squeeze everything they can out of you so um i, I found that interesting and when you know that going in you, you you know what to expect um it definitely helps uh the the goal is to try to understand it and not take it personally and try to try to play along with that and and you know negotiate back don't be afraid to to if someone is negotiating you on the price or negotiating on something they're one of two things. They're either using you to try to leverage someone else or they're serious in moving forward and, and they're trying to, to get as much as they can out of you. So if it's the first case, there's not much you can do, but if it's the latter, then then negotiate back. You know, if they're interested in your service, push back a little and get some make sure you don't end up with a deal that you regret the moment you walk out. It's better to pass on work that has very little margin and uh to take that work and, and not be happy and not make any money at the end of the day um, and that's what a lot of small businesses or businesses that are struggling will do is they'll see that deposit check and say you know what that saves us for the next two months or so three months we're good but you're just delaying the problems and you're just compounding those problems and you're never going to dig out of that hole if you're not able to to say you know what no i'm not taking this project unless the margins are, are what they're supposed to be you you have a pretty broad experience with technology and the development yeah. of it what, and we're moving to the cloud. Do you see, is there another evolution there that you see happening that may not be readily obvious to uh, the rest of us who are on the business side that, that you think is going to take place in the future? I, I think within, I, I, like, I don't like saying timeframes, but let's just say 10 years and more or less. 
um, AI technology is pushing so much. And right now you have, you know, Siri, Cortana, Alexa, you have all these personal assistants. And, you know, I just started noticing Cortana sends me a recap of my week's yeah. uh, stuff in Outlook. I think within 10 years, that virtual assistant is going to just be as if another human being was talking to you and, and you'll, you'll either get a text message or a call or something and say, don't forget you have this meeting. Uh, don't forget you have this. And, and it's already almost there, but it's not, you know, it's not perfect. There's also issues with privacy laws and all that at the moment. But I think once all that is knocked out, um, you're going to see AI where you, you and I are having conversation and then I'm going to turn around and talk to my computer or my phone in the same way that I'm talking to you and then work will get done. So I think we have to look at that. AI is here to stay. It's it's already embedded in a lot of these large companies. Um, and if you're, if again, back when there was a digital divide where people adopted cell phones and new technologies and people didn't, that, that gap just grows exponentially. And those that aren't understanding of AI or seeing where it's going, stuff like that, are going to end up on the wrong side of that technology. And you and you can't stop that train. It's going there, and it's it's going to happen regardless of, of what people uh, want to do. So ideally you should be on the good side of AI and, and try to understand it and, and you know use it where you can. I know you have a very busy day. I just, uh, we all appreciate you uh, taking the time and sharing some of your insights. No and, problem. Uh, thanks for joining us and have a fantastic weekend. Thanks for having me, you too. Take care. Take care.